Hi everyone, I'm Susan Birch and welcome back to another A Healthy New Zealand podcast. Heart disease is still the number one killer in New Zealand and there is a considerable debate around the role that cholesterol plays in this process, the use of statins and also whether eating saturated fat increases our risk or not. And today I'm joined by Dr. Ronald Krauss, who is a lipidologist and the director of the atherosclerosis research at Children's Hospital Oakland Research Institute. Dr. Krauss is a pioneer in the field of lipid research. He's changed the way we all think about cholesterol, how to measure it, and how the foods we eat affect our cholesterol. He's got a very long list of credentials that I'll include in the show notes. And I think I counted over 470 published research papers on this topic. I am really grateful to Dr. Krauss for taking time out of his very busy schedule today to help us all get a better understanding of this really important and very complex topic. So welcome Dr. Krauss and thank you for being here. Well, well, thank you very much for the invitation. I look forward to our discussion. Would you start off by telling us a little bit about yourself and your research mm -hmm. and exactly what a lipidologist does and how a lipidologist is different from a cardiologist? Sure. Uh, I, I might also mention that my current academic appointment is a professor at the University of California, San Francisco. That's something that um, sort of updated my CV um, not too long ago, oh, um, and and I do have a, a combination of clinical and research activities in the area of lipids. Uh, so lipidology is a clinical uh, subspecialty of medicine that um, is oriented around understanding uh, cholesterol uh, and how it affects heart disease risk and how we may uh, be able to modify that risk by affecting uh, cholesterol and lipid levels. Um, so my work over the years has focused on uh, understanding the relationship of uh, the various lipid uh, forms in the blood, which we can talk about uh, later, uh, to heart disease risk and how uh, we can improve our risk by both dietary means as well as, uh, as medication. Uh, and so this has been uh, a journey over uh, quite some period of time for me, uh, and the field has evolved very, very significantly over that period of time. And, um, and it's really been exciting to see um, how the advances that we've made have been translated into clinical practice, both in terms of evaluating heart disease risk using uh, uh, various uh, lipid measurements that I've been uh, involved with making, uh, and also how we can use those measurements to help guide um, our, our treatment. So um, that's kind of, in a nutshell, uh, my main areas of interest. And um, uh, it, it's an evolving field, and uh, there's, uh, there's lots to talk about. Yeah. Would you start off then just giving us a basic overview of what cholesterol is, why it's so important to our health, and then we keep hearing about good and bad cholesterol. And could you clarify what we're actually talking about when we're talking about good and bad cholesterol? Sure. So um, cholesterol itself uh, is a substance that uh, is present in all the tissues in our body. It's a, it's a essential component of our cells. Uh, and so it's, uh, it's something that... Um, uh, we need, and it's it's regulated uh, quite carefully in the in the body, uh, in, in the cells, and in the bloodstream. So, um, having a, the right amount of cholesterol in our tissues is very important. Um, but what we're mainly mainly concerned about in in our clinical practice is how cholesterol relates to heart disease risk, since we know that um, higher levels of cholesterol result in higher levels of heart disease. But cholesterol is not um, uh, the whole story. Uh, it's really just part of the story. Um, cholesterol circulates in the blood um, as a complex with other types of molecules. And um, what, what that forms uh, are lipoproteins. Lipoproteins um, are 
collections of uh, both proteins and lipids, including cholesterol. So lipids are the fatty substances of which cholesterol is just one. There's other lipids as well. Uh, and we focus on the cholesterol part of it because that is what winds up in our arteries and causes plaques and uh, ultimately in increase the risk for heart disease and stroke. Um, but the package that is in the blood is really uh, uh, this lipoprotein particle, which is really a ball. Uh, it's, it's a tiny uh, microscopic um, uh, sphere uh, that has proteins uh, and uh, cholesterol and other lipids, as I mentioned. Um, and then it, it turns out, and this is where my, my own work uh, comes into play, that there's many different forms of these uh, lipoprotein particles in the blood. Uh, and the two major forms in the blood um, are called low density um, lipoprotein or LDL uh, and high density lipoprotein or HDL. And so uh, the LDL, uh, we sometimes uh, uh, also uh, refer to that as the uh, L or lousy cholesterol, it's the bad cholesterol. Uh, and the HDL, uh, we sometimes refer to as the healthy um, uh, form of cholesterol in the blood uh, because it's associated with uh, protection from heart disease risk. And so we measure um, LDL and HDL uh, in various ways, but what we really focus on uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of understanding um, heart disease risk are the particles uh, that uh, uh, the LDL and HDL are found in. And so uh, within those particles, it turns out there's even further uh, breakdown of, uh, of different subtypes of LDL and HDL. But by and large, um, for um, the, the clinicians who uh, try to uh, work with uh, people to reduce heart disease risk, they, they focus on uh, those two major categories. Okay. And so I'd really like to get on to the different particles in a moment, but what you're really saying there, or just to clarify, if this is what you're saying, you're saying that those particles carry the cholesterol in the right. bloodstream around the body right. and other substances, triglycerides and vitamins and other right. things and deliver those and deliver that to the cells that need them. Is that correct? Yeah, well, yeah, so we're talking about, right, the, the particles in the blood that carry a cholesterol and, and other components, um, uh, they, they circulate and uh, they do interact with various tissues. They can be taken up um, uh, uh, by, by the liver, which is the main uh, uh, organ in the body that helps remove those particles from the blood. Um, but they can also wind up in the arteries if there's excess amounts that cannot be effectively removed by the liver, they can uh, wind up in the wrong place, namely on the artery wall where they can, uh, where the LDLs can lead to plaque. Um, the HDLs, if there's enough HDLs, can help remove some of that cholesterol. So that's the balance that um, often um, we, we deal with in, uh, in the clinic is the relative amounts of the bad and the good cholesterol, uh, which determine how much wind up in the artery wall. Right. So, so when we get just a basic cholesterol panel measured by our GP, what he's measuring is the amount of cholesterol in, in those LDL particles, but he's not telling us how many particles we've got. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah. So the standard uh, lipid panel, which is uh, you know, well established and it certainly has a, has a role in clinical practice, uh, involves measuring uh, co uh, cholesterol, uh, the total cholesterol, and then the cholesterol uh, in LDL and HDL. So that's called LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol. That is uh, just looking at the cholesterol, not looking at the particle uh, concentration. Oh. But that already carries information because generally, um, the more um, particles of LDL you have, uh, the higher uh, the LDL cholesterol level is going to be. There's going to be more cholesterol uh, in the LDL. And conversely, uh, the higher um, the uh, uh, number of HDL particles in general, there's generally a higher level of HDL cholesterol. So those two things tend to track together. Um, and um, that, that works pretty well uh, for clinical practice. Um, but not, it's, not, it's not a perfect 
correlation. So you can't always predict the number of particles from the LDL cholesterol, and you can't predict the number of uh, HDL particles from the HDL cholesterol. So it's not a perfect relationship. And then the third thing this measures, so, so what we talked about here is uh, measuring the total cholesterol and then the breakdown into LDL and HDL cholesterol um, uh, in the simple lipid panel. And then the, uh, the, the, the other thing that's measured is triglyceride, which is a completely different um, player. It's a different kind of fat. Um, it's also transported on lipoprotein particles. Um, and those particles uh, are called VLDL, they're very low density lipoproteins. So that's the third major player in the system. Uh, it's, H, it's LDL, uh, HDL, and uh, triglyceride. H, uh, in other words, uh, LDL cholesterol, HDL cholesterol, uh, and triglyceride. What role does triglycerides play in the heart disease development? Uh, well, triglyceride, um, uh, has a, a very uh, significant effect on heart disease risk uh, for a number of reasons. Uh, first, that um, those VLDL that I mentioned uh, can also wind up in the artery wall. So just like the LDL, they can, they can cause uh, buildup called atherosclerosis, the buildup of uh, lipids and plaques in the artery wall. So they can be dangerous in and of themselves. Uh, but the other important thing about triglyceride is that it tends to uh, be uh, correlated with a number of other metabolic effects, um, many of which are related to excess body weight uh, and insulin resistance that also increase the risk of both heart disease uh, and other conditions like diabetes. So triglyceride is both a direct um, index of a, a, of a bad form of lipid in the blood directly, uh, as well as um, a cluster of other changes that can be associated with um, both heart disease and diabetes. Uh, and that leads into a syndrome uh, that has been called the metabolic syndrome. And so um, high levels of triglyceride are often a marker for this uh, collection of risk factors um, called metabolic syndrome. Uh, and one of those risk factors actually is low levels of HDL. So high levels of triglyceride uh, can be associated with low levels of the good cholesterol. Uh, and that is a key feature of the metabolic syndrome. And so that's a very important cause of uh, uh, increased risk for uh, heart disease and diabetes in the population. Um, it, it's really the most prevalent lipid trait, um, even more than high LDL. It's, it's the most common uh, lipid trait associated with heart disease risk in the population, um, uh, at least in Western countries. And that is largely because of the um, increasing problem we're having with um, uh, obesity, excess body weight, which can uh, impact that metabolic syndrome and cause it to, uh, it's, it's, it's really been an explosion of uh, the increase in that, in that trait in the population as our, our body weight problem has increased. I'd like, a little bit later on, I'd like to get into why our triglycerides do increase like that. But with that metabolic syndrome, we're also looking at high blood pressure and that high um, waist to height ratio as That's well. Right. That's right. There's a, there's a, a, a cluster that, um, uh, various combinations of those conditions, high triglyceride, low HDL cholesterol, uh, as you, uh, adip excess adiposity, and as you point out, high blood pressure um, uh, can be part of that as well. Right. And we hear some talk about the triglyceride HDL ratio. So is that a good measure? Is that, is that how we look at the, the increased risk if the triglycerides are too high, that is that ratio a good measure for people to consider? Yeah, uh, we've, done, we've done some work. We published uh, a paper on that ratio a while ago. It's a good measure of um, uh, insulin resistance, which is another part of the metabolic right. syndrome uh, that can predispose to diabetes. Uh, but it also uh, represents um, uh, a, a bad combination for heart disease as well. Mm. High, high triglyceride, low HDL. And the ratio captures both of those, yes. So a lot of your research has been looking at 
the particle size, is that right? And that those LDL particles come in a range of different sizes and those different sizes have different effects on the risk factors? Right, so um, uh, yeah, so, so we, we discovered some time ago that um, uh, LDL particles, as you say, do come in different sizes, um, and the size of the particles affects whether they're uh, more or less likely uh, to wind up in the artery wall. Um, and um, that actually also is related to what we just talked about regarding triglyceride levels, because um, uh, one of the uh, correlates, one of the things that correlates with high triglyceride levels is increased levels of smaller LDL particles uh, 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 rather than larger LDL particles. So those two main categories, small LDL and large LDL, um, are, are what we are, have been focusing on because um, it's the smaller LDL particles that tend to be associated with higher heart disease risk. Um, and as I say, that's one of the reasons that high triglycerides is a uh, is a marker uh, for higher risk because not only is it associated with all the things we just talked about, low HDL, insulin resistance, uh, uh, high blood pressure, it's also associated with high levels of small LDL. And that brings the LDL into the picture. It, 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 it's sort of a, a key uh, factor in the metabolic syndrome that contributes to higher uh, risk for heart disease and stroke. Um, whereas the larger LDL particles um, despite the fact that they actually have uh, more, somewhat more cholesterol in them, um, are associated with much lower risk of heart disease. And so you've developed or been um, part of the development of being able to test for those different particle sizes? Right. So, so it, it, it's been a, a, a process over a number of years to develop tools that uh, can be used clinically that um, can uh, distinguish uh, those different LDL particles, um, uh, it, but they're not necessarily widely available and uh, actually don't know uh, what may be available uh, in your country that would permit those measurements to be made. Um, uh, it, there's still a variety of different approaches for, uh, for, for doing that. The, the technique that uh, we use in, my, in, in the U.S., uh, at least that I use in my program, is a, a technique we developed that's offered by one of the major labs uh, in this country, but it's not, I, uh, unfortunately, a global um, method. It's not available globally. So um, uh, it, we really are trying to encourage greater adoption of this methodology because, um, as we touched on briefly uh, uh, earlier, LDL cholesterol, which is sort of the standard measurement that's available, is, um, is, is not always uh, correlated with the levels of those small LDL particles. Um, and that's in part because those particles have less cholesterol in them. So they, they, they're actually more compact and more dangerous um, but um, don't necessarily have um, uh, excess cholesterol. And therefore, when you measure LDL cholesterol, you don't always uh, uh, pick up uh, a accurate measure of the concentrations of the small LDL particles. So we'd like to see more of that testing being done. Um, but as I say, I don't know exactly what's available in your country. Mm. Mm. And that sounds like an important distinction to make when people are looking at, or you know, and clinicians are looking at how they're going to help manage. Yeah, yeah, I, yeah. Um, no, in, in my clinical, my clinical practice, and you know, the the, the lipidologists, the lipid uh, specialists, the clinical specialists in lipids uh, 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 are uh, moving towards. Uh, greater appreciation of the importance of, uh, of making those measurements um, to help guide uh, not just risk assessment, not just to know who may be at higher risk based on um, those, uh, those particle profiles, but also how we can best gauge the effectiveness of our, of our treatment uh, to monitor improvement. And, and I, I use it, uh, it's really in my clinical practice, it's something that I do um, 
we very often. I, I see challenging patients with uh, complex metabolic conditions who have, are concerned about their disc heart disease, and um, I can really help to tease apart um, uh, that uh, that risk in terms of understanding what is specifically involved when I can measure these uh, uh, these more uh, detailed tests. So is there something that causes the LDL to be smaller? Why, why do we have different sized LDL particles? Well, that's an area of, uh, of ongoing research, but uh, our, our own work and, and, and some other studies have suggested that it all begins with, uh, with triglyceride. Um, and I mentioned that higher triglyceride is associated with higher levels of small LDL. Uh, and that triglyceride, as we also mentioned, um, mainly represents uh, levels of these VLDL, very low density lipoprotein particles that are, are packed with triglyceride. They're produced by the liver. Uh, they tend to be um, uh, increased. Uh, uh, this, the, these VLDL particles uh, go up. Uh, if you're overweight, that gets into the obesity uh, relationship I discussed a moment ago. Uh, and they can also be um, increased uh, and, and the liver will make more of them uh, if you're consuming uh, more carbohydrates, particularly sugars, uh, which tend to drive up levels of these particles. Uh, and once they get into the bloodstream, um, they cause a variety of metabolic effects to occur, and I won't go into all the details, um, but the net result is that they're eventually broken down um, uh, to smaller, uh, smaller particles. The VLDL are large particles. They come out packed with triglyceride, um, but as they circulate in the blood, they get smaller and smaller. Uh, and ultimately, um, that process um, of degradation of ALDL yields these small LDL particles. The small LDL particles are a product of those VLDLs. So they're metabolically connected as a precursor and a product. And so then, so an excess of carbohydrates and probably processed carbohydrates, I'm assuming, would increase the triglycerides. The triglycerides then increase the number of small LDL that you have circulating. And then those are more easily able to get into the artery wall right. and right. start causing plaque. Right. Yeah, that, that's right. And, and all along the way, all, uh, the LDL particles themselves are are bad for the arteries. So that, that whole spectrum of particles, starting with VLDL and winding up a small LDL, that whole pathway um, is what's uh, uh, really responsible for increased risk. But the small LDL who are at the end of that pathway uh, tend to hang around in the blood for a long time because the liver has a reduced capacity to remove those particles from the blood. Wow. And so they tend to circulate longer. They're not taken up as effectively. That's one of the main reasons um, that, that I think, that we think that it's uh, particularly harmful because um, the longer they circulate, uh, the more uh, they acquire properties that make them more toxic to the arteries. Um, uh, uh, and, and they also have a tendency not just to get into the artery more, more easily than larger particles, um, but they tend to stick more tightly. That's one of the uh, things we don't want to have happen. Uh, uh, and they tend to get oxidized. They can turn uh, rancid, if you will, once they get into the artery. And that's also a very toxic uh, effect of these, uh, uh, of these particles. Um, so there's a variety of factors that come into play that make them uh, more hazardous to the artery. So do they get oxidized before they get into the artery as well? Because we hear about oxidized LDL. That's right. Yeah, oxidized LDL tends to be uh, a mirror for this, uh, these particles as well. Um, most of the oxidation occurs in the artery, however. Um, okay. And some of, some, some of those oxidized LDL uh, can actually leak out of the artery into the blood. So what we measure in the blood is sort of a, a little bit of an overflow <laughs> almost. Wow. Uh, they, they don't get oxidized in the blood, they get oxidized in the tissues, but some of those oxidized LDL can come back into the blood. Okay. That's, yeah. I always wondered what the difference between small yeah. LDL and oxidized LDL yeah. Yeah. was. Yeah, yeah. yeah. well, they're, they're not identical because other kinds of LDL can be oxidized as well, but this is the main source in the, in the artery. Okay. 
And so does the artery need, does there need to be something else going on for the artery be, to be damaged for these particles to get through? Or can they just get through based basically on their size and availability of them? Well, atherosclerosis, the condition uh, that we're talking about um, that can cause plaques and, and heart disease uh, is, is a complex mechanism um, involving uh, both lipids as well as inflammation. Um, and inflammation um, uh, can start the process off. Uh, so um, uh, many people think that um, uh, having high levels of the lipoprotein particles, of the LDL particles, is not uh, sufficient, that there has to be some other factors involved. Uh, and that's where we get into things like um, uh, smoking, high blood pressure, genetics, all of which can affect the um, susceptibility of the artery to uh, being damaged by these, by these lipoprotein particles. So, so th these things tend to work um, in conjunction with each other. Now, there are people who have exceedingly high levels of LDL, and this can also be true for large LDL. If, it gets, if the levels get high enough, um, that may be sufficient to cause heart disease. Uh, and vascular problems. Uh, but for most of us in the population, those levels are not, are not super high, but they're high enough um, to cause damage um, if there's other factors uh, going on as well. I'm one of those people I've got familiar. When you get those genetic traits that really raise the LDL high, then um, that, that is sufficient to be concerned about, yeah. I do have very high HDL and I've got my slow triglycerides. So, you know, yeah. I'm one of those very tricky people and there are quite a few of us out there who yeah. don't really fit into a standard model and it's quite difficult to know what decisions to make, you know, when you're fit right. and healthy and got good blood pressure and you're a normal weight. Right, right. Well, we sometimes use uh, ancillary uh, tests on uh, people like that. When I see someone like you in my, in my clinic, um, uh, we still don't know that having a high HDL in all cases is protective. There are, um, uh, there's a, more and more evidence that there are people who have very high HDL minority, but some who, whose HDL is not protective. Uh, it could actually uh, be, uh, a form of HDL that is, uh, uh, is, is not good for you. So we don't want to uh, just take that for granted, um, unfortunately. Uh, uh, so not to create any excess worry, but, but in those, I, I, see, I, see a lot of, I see a lot of patients like you. Uh, and um, uh, I, I, I often use in that situation for somebody who appears to be and, and is in all other respects healthy, um, we look at uh, something called the coronary artery calcium score, which is a, um, a very well validated uh, procedure using a, a form of a CT scan uh, that, that allows us to determine the amount of plaque that exists in the, uh, in the, in the heart, in the coronary arteries in particular. Um, since many people like you will have a um, uh, a high LDL and high HDL, and uh, as a result of having a good balance and the HDL is working like it should, um, there's absolutely no plaque in the arteries and the, and the coronary calcium score uh, in many of those patients that I see is zero. And that's very reassuring because it tends to confirm the clinical impression that I would have for, for you, for example, um, that you're uh, not necessarily uh, at super high risk because your HDL is high. But I wouldn't be uh, totally confident of that um, uh, without, without additional information. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I think, is it true that for people like myself, often the problem is that we're not able to, the liver's not reabsorbing the cholesterol so that, right. so that right. the step is not working properly? Yeah, people, uh, you know, uh, genetics plays a big role in everything we're talking about, but there's, uh, uh, there's one uh, gene in particular that can cause uh, very severe cholesterol elevations, elevations of LDL and LDL particles, and that's uh, a, a protein in the liver that's responsible for removing LDL from the blood. Um, when that protein is uh, genetically 
uh, affected, so it's not functioning properly. Um, that leads to a failure of the liver to take up um, that LDL. And then we get into what I talked about a moment ago, um, where if the LDL isn't able to be cleared from the blood, it circulates uh, for prolonged periods of time. Uh, and this is uh, one cause. It's not, the, it's not the most common cause of, um, of atherosclerosis, but it certainly is one mechanism that results from just having that LDL um, uh, in the bloodstream uh, wind up ultimately in the artery because it's not being effectively cleared. Um, and so we, 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 in that case, we often have to, if we really feel a patient uh, or a person is at high risk um, uh, due to that condition, um, and, and most, most people with this condition are at high risk, um, we, uh, we often have to move to a medication to help lower the LDL to overcome that genetic deficiency. Right. And I guess that's where if I had passion A or the, you know, the big buoyant LDL, yeah. that would be a reduced risk for me as well. Uh, yeah, it, it, yes, uh, yes and no. Uh, um, yeah, so it, you, you talked about uh, the, the a, the a and B. So the pattern A, we, we used to designate people with large LDL, pattern B with maybe small LDL. And uh, most patients uh, uh, who have um, this uh, genetic uh, deficiency in the, uh, in the, in the protein, uh, the, it's a, a receptor in the liver that clears the LDL from the blood. Most of these people do have large LDL, actually, uh, but that doesn't necessarily um, imply lower risk because these particles can still um, accumulate in the in the blood to high enough levels to cause uh, buildup in the artery. So it's it's not a um, uh, it's it, it, it still requires further evaluation, even even uh, if the LDL is large in those situations, to make sure that we're not overlooking risk for heart disease. It's very nuanced and complex, isn't it? Mm. Well, that's why we have a clinical field of lipidology, <laughs> uh, <laughs> because if it were super easy, I probably wouldn't need to do what I do. <laughs> So I guess people will be wondering what they can do. You know, we've talked about this cluster of um, sort of things, you know, blood pressure and high triglycerides and excess weight. What can people do to lower their risk? And, you know, you talked about high carbohydrates or excess carbohydrate diet, increasing the triglycerides. Can we reverse that small LDL if we change our diet and our lifestyle? Right. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's something I've been very interested in, both from a research standpoint as well as uh, wearing my clinical hat. Um, and um, we've done a number of studies over the years that suggest that if uh, people who have um, higher risk uh, with this metabolic syndrome in particular in the small LDL trait, uh, were to adopt a lifestyle where they were able to keep their uh, body weight into the um, acceptable range. We can talk about what that would be. Um, and also limit the amount of carbohydrates, particularly um, uh, processed, uh, highly processed starches and, and sugars, that probably in 90% of those individuals, we can reverse that trait. Um, it's, it's, it's very, very manageable. Um, but it takes uh, some, some hard work, particularly for the weight loss part, uh, because uh, you know, we're struggling with that in our society. Um, and um, uh, to really reverse it, um, uh, and from some people, they have to get down to uh, be, uh, a lean body weight. But in principle, um, th that does tell us that it is possible to reverse this trait, even though there's underlying genetic predisposition to that is something that we can overcome. And that applies to that whole cluster of risk factors that go along with a metabolic syndrome, uh, with you know, high triglyceride, uh, high blood pressure, uh, insulin resistance, uh, and small LDL. All of those things can be um, reversed with, uh, with a combination of weight loss and a low, lower carbohydrate intake. And, and sometimes weight loss is sufficient. Um, if you lose, if you lose, if you, if you can achieve leanness um, and you're physically active, then carbohydrate intake might be more uh, generous. But if you're uh, not able to get down to a lean weight, if you're not really highly physically active, then the carbohydrate 
uh, in the diet is, uh, is really important as well. And so this has been a bit of a change in sort of philosophy, hasn't it, over recent years that, that we should be reducing our carbohydrate mm -hmm. rather than our saturated fat and our cholesterol intake. I think you've had quite a lot to do with that. I, I, I guess so. I can, I can plead guilty uh, to that uh, <laughs> accusation. Uh, when I entered uh, the field as a, uh, both a clinician and a researcher um, interested in nutrition, um, I became chair of the American Heart Association Nutrition Committee. This was some time ago when um, the mantra was very much low fat. Um, and I was responsible for um, generating some dietary guidelines for the US, uh, for the American Heart Association, that um, really perpetuated uh, that approach using uh, lower fat uh, as a means of reducing, uh, in particular, saturated fat, animal fat, because uh, it had been um, uh, shown uh, quite clearly, and our own studies showed this, that uh, saturated fat can raise LDL cholesterol. Um, but my own research um, at that time um, was beginning to tell me that, um, that saturated fat really wasn't the main problem because saturated fat affected mainly these larger LDL particles. And what we were finding is that um, uh, the smaller particles um, were not affected by saturated fat uh, for most people, that they were highly uh, uh, affected by carbohydrates. So in one of the first studies that I did in my own research program um, to test the low fat diet, we put people on a low fat, higher carbohydrate diet, which was really what was being recommended at the time. And we actually um, pushed more people into the metabolic syndrome uh, as a result of that. It was actually, it actually aggravated uh, uh, their, their overall cardiovascular risk. And um, as we did more studies to confirm that, um, uh, I realized those guidelines were something I really was not comfortable with. So I started to try to change the guidelines by writing them a second time about four years later, uh, opening the door a little bit to uh, higher fat intake and lower carb as an option, particularly for people with metabolic syndrome. Uh, but uh, that has still been a, an uphill struggle because um, the guidelines are still very much focused on saturated fat and more and more uh, we're coming to realize that um, uh, that, that we in, in our society we're eating too much processed carbohydrates and sugars, and that that is really uh, the driver, a main a main driver uh, for heart disease risk as it relates to diet. So, if saturated saturated fat isn't really a problem, I mean we have got you know we've got keto diets and all these low carb diets and should we still be a little bit careful about our fat intake or do you think do you think saturated fat doesn't matter at all or is it, i mean that's probably too complex a question really uh, uh, yeah well it touches on uh, uh, differences uh, among us and how we respond to diet um, so uh, making recommendations to the general public is um, is important but when it comes to us as individuals, those recommendations uh, might not always be the best ones. Um, because um, uh, so uh, in particular regarding saturated fat, uh, this is something again, I tumbled on early on. I realized that, that we all differ in how we respond um, to nutrients, including saturated fats. And saturated fat comes in different forms. That makes it even more complex. Uh, there's different types of saturated fat in different foods. Um, but uh, there are some people um, who really should avoid saturated fat because they tend to be really uh, what we call hyper responders. They go on a, a diet that's high in uh, animal, uh, animal fat, animal products, um, uh, uh, such as uh, fatty meats, uh, um, whole fat dairy products, et cetera, and their cholesterol uh, will, will skyrocket. I have some of those patients, but they're in the minority. And the, ma the majority of us, are relatively um, uh, not so much, not, not terribly responsive. Uh, our levels don't go up so high uh, when we consume saturated fat. And as I mentioned, for most of us, it's the larger LDL that go up, not the smaller. So um, that tends to um, 
put the saturated fat issue in perspective across the population that in general, for most individuals, um, uh, it's very hard to find evidence that saturated fat itself um, is hazardous. And in fact, I published a paper, gosh, over 10 years ago now that I think kind of shook up the field because we looked at um, all of the prior evidence from um, studies in which populations were uh, followed uh, over time uh, and their dietary intake was recorded and, and there was an effort to uh, relate their diet to heart disease uh, risk. And we could not find any evidence that saturated fat itself was related to the risk of, uh, of heart disease. And in fact, there tended to be uh, strangely and uh, kind of provocatively um, a reduced risk of stroke uh, with higher saturated fat. So that really challenged the, the whole basis, both in terms of uh, the lipid effects, as I mentioned, as well as the uh, evidence from these um, population studies that we were really overemphasizing saturated fat um, as a uh, uh, a component of the diet that is responsible, uh, is most responsible for heart disease risk, at least in this um, in this day and age, it's not saturated fat, it's carbohydrate. Because in New Zealand, we have a very strong push towards using vegetable oils and instead of saturated fat because they are shown to lower cholesterol right, level. Right, but there right. are other complications from added vegetable oils, yeah. oxi more oxidized LDL. There's a lot of com controversy about this. Uh, and I'm, I'm sort of um, torn uh, on this issue because um, in terms of LDL uh, levels, it is true um, that um, unsaturated oils uh, uh, will uh, produce lower levels of LDL than saturated fats. So, so we can lower LDL by switching uh, from a high saturated fat to a low, to a high unsaturated fat diet. Um, the question is, is that sufficient to protect us from heart disease risk? Um, and that's where I think the evidence gets very thin, uh, to almost maybe to the point of non-existence. Um, th there's really not convincing evidence um, that making that change, and even if your LDL cholesterol goes down, um, it doesn't necessarily predict um, lower heart disease risk. And if one digs into the data that are out there, um, it gets very hard uh, to prove that, that that's beneficial. There are some, and I'm not necessarily in that camp, who actually worry that too much of the uh, polyunsaturated fats from vegetable sources um, that are uh, a result of processing uh, of the oils, um, too much of those processed oils could potentially have uh, damaging effects. So there's some, some evidence to that uh, uh, that's out there. Uh, I don't know that it's totally convincing. So I'm not sure I would uh, advocate uh, avoiding them because they're harmful. I would just um, argue that it's not necessarily a substitution that um, is going to be beneficial. Has there been any research done on vegetable oils and the small LDL compared with the large LDL? Uh, uh, unfortunately not. This is uh, where uh, our, our funding kind of dried up. We, we, we did a lot of work um, with um, uh, high, high saturated fat uh, versus monounsaturated fat with uh, substituting uh, olive oil, which is monounsaturated for um, whole fat dairy products, which are saturated. Um, and, and that's where we saw that the saturated fat really wasn't um, um, affecting the smaller LDL particles. Um, uh, the olive oil, the monounsaturated fat was neutral. Um, so we, we, but we don't know as much about polyunsaturated fat. There's some evidence um, that it, uh, it works mainly on the larger LDL particles, uh, but that's still not um, necessarily as, as solid um, science as we have for um, saturated fat. Right, because so many of the processed foods come along with these vegetable oils as well. So I was wondering if, you know, if it was yeah. double. Well, the whole, yeah, the whole idea of processing, <laughs> yeah, it does, yeah. I mean, the whole idea of processing itself is, is, one, is one thing that many of us can, even those people who are not comfortable um, uh, allowing uh, higher levels of saturated fat in the diet, um, 
uh, would would agree probably that there's um, that the processing of foods, and this relates to carbohydrates as well as oils, um, can have uh, effects that uh, deplete uh, our our diet of natural uh, forms of these substances when they're found in uh, in whole foods that are unprocessed. Um, they, they could have entirely different effects, and that does raise a, a, an issue that. That I've tried to advocate, um, and it's, I think at least in the U.S., the guidelines are beginning to recognize this. That um, it's not so much um, uh, this or that type of fat; um, it's really uh, what package uh, that fat is being consumed in. Um, and for example, there is growing evidence that whole fat dairy products, which, as I mentioned, because of their saturated fat, tend to result in higher uh, LDL levels, high LDL cholesterol levels, may actually have beneficial metabolic effects and uh, some uh, reduction in heart disease risk uh, due to the kinds, due to maybe the overall food in which it's being consumed. For example, cheese, which everybody, uh, which many people uh, over the years has considered sort of a no-no for most people uh, trying to reduce their risk of heart disease. Um, that package, um, consists of um, uh, uh, you know, fermented dairy products, uh, the uh, matrix, that is the substance of the food itself and how it's uh, uh, handled when we consume it, um, does not seem to have an adverse effect on either cholesterol levels or heart disease risk. So it's, it's a case where just focusing on the fat type and the, and the content of that fat really misses the picture um, we have to be looking at the whole foods. And those studies are much harder to do, uh, to study real foods. And there's not been as much research on that. Um, but um, I think we need to move away from uh, dissecting out the individual um, types of molecules and foods and thinking about uh, the, the, whole, the whole package. And that goes for carbohydrates as well. I should say, as much as um, uh, we consider certain kinds of car carbohydrate, um, a bad food choice, um, it's really the processing of, of those carbohydrates, the, uh, um, the white starches uh, that have what's called the high glycemic index, that is the ones that tend to raise, they tend to raise blood sugar. Uh, those are the ones that um, are really the ones to avoid, whereas uh, carbohydrates coming in uh, more healthful packages, uh, such as um, unprocessed whole kernel uh, grains, uh, things like dark, uh, brown rice and um, uh, quinoa and uh, uh, even uh, dark bread, um, uh, whole, whole rye uh, bread, those carbohydrates may not have um, an adverse effect at all. Um, uh, we really have incriminated carbohydrates uh, mainly because uh, we've been eating the wrong kinds of carbohydrates. Mm. And I think that's such an important point if we eat real food right. rather yeah. than um, yeah. rather than processed food. And it's yeah. what we eat that food with as well, you know. Um, perhaps right. a, you know, the whole so dietary think, pattern, yeah, the whole dietary pattern. No, sorry. Right. So I'd like to just get on to statins briefly um, before we sort of run out of our time today sure. Sure. because that's something that, there's a lot of debate about and people are really concerned about. And I know that you've been doing a lot of research into statins. Yes. So could you, you know, I know there's a place for them. Could you talk about, you know, sort of the primary and secondary, um, you know, care model of using statins and then also about some of the research you've done into the effects of them? Okay. Sure. Yeah. No, statins, uh, it's an important topic. Um, statins, uh, I'd have to say the bottom line is they've represented a, a huge breakthrough in our ability to uh, manage heart disease risk for a great many people. Um, uh, they work uh, to lower uh, cholesterol, they lower LDL, they lower uh, both small and large LDL particles, maybe uh, not quite so effective on the small particles, but they can uh, generally uh, substantially reduced, particularly with the um, current generation of statins that are the higher potency, we can get as much as a 50% reduction in LDL levels. So for people that are at high risk for heart disease or have had heart disease, uh, the studies unequivocally show 
that you can reduce the risk of having heart attacks uh, and, and also strokes. Um, there is not quite as much data on life expectancy. Those are harder studies to do. And people have kind of picked on that saying, well, if you can't prolong life, is that really um, uh, something worth taking? But, um, but heart disease, as you mentioned, uh, is the leading cause of death, um, becoming globally the leading cause of death. Um, and um, uh, so if you can reduce heart disease, that's, that's a benefit. The question is, um, who, is uh, who are the candidates for statin treatment? Um, and we can start with people that are uh, uh, already following healthful lifestyle, um, monitoring their, their diet, eating uh, uh, the right kinds of foods we just talked about, exercising, um, and uh, who um, nevertheless have a high LDL level. And uh, particularly if they have a high, if they have a family history of heart disease, suggesting genetic factors. Um, the studies unequivocally show that statins uh, are beneficial in those patients um, uh, to reduce heart disease risk. Uh, it's not a panacea. It doesn't necessarily guarantee um, complete protection, but uh, one can expect a 30 to 40% reduction in risk. And those studies have been done time and time again. Um, and there's just no question that in that particular setting, uh, for those kinds of individuals um, who need uh, to get their LDL down, um, statins are by far and away the best way to achieve that. Um, um, uh, uh, diet, this, this of course remains important, but um, we're talking about people who retain a high level of LDL uh, on, on, a, on a healthful diet. Uh, the okay. question then becomes, uh, what about the rest of the population? Um, the, so we're, we're extending our guidelines to a larger and larger group of uh, individuals because of the success of these statin trials. And in the process, um, I feel that we are now uh, uh, advocating statin use in many people who really don't need it. Uh, and so then it becomes a question of how you sort out who needs it and who doesn't. And that's, again, a lipidologist type of exercise. We, I see patients who are wondering if they should take a statin, and that becomes a complex clinical judgment. Um, but uh, the reason that um, we need to be concerned about that, because you can say, well, maybe everybody should be taking a statin. Some, some people have advocated that, and I firmly uh, disagree with that position because um, there is a large uh, number of individuals who, A, are not necessarily going to benefit from a statin because they're not in the right clinical situation. Uh, and there can also be um, adverse effects. There can be um, negative effects. People can get uh, muscle uh, damage and muscle uh, uh, effects of statins that can be quite significant um, in, a, in a pretty reasonably uh, significant minority of statin users, maybe anywhere from 5 to 10 percent or more of statin users uh, will have muscle problems as a result of statin use. Uh, and then we've also recognized recently that there's an increased risk of diabetes with statin use. So statin, that's sort of the the downside of statin for people um, is that uh, particularly women I think, appear to be at higher risk of developing type 2 diabetes on statins. And we're working, my research is still working on trying to identify uh, who may be at particular risk for these side effects uh, and on the other side of the coin, who is most likely to benefit. So making that decision on um, where the benefits outweigh the risk is another um, uh, clinical arena that needs, needs more work. And, um, it's often a matter of judgment on the part of the doctor and the patient as to whether that's worth, worth the risk. But um, it's, so it's not, a, it's not a, a all or none situation. Um, some people are arguing that statins are hazardous and they should be, uh, nobody should take them. That, that, that's indefensible in my view because um, the benefits are so significant in people that are uh, at high risk. Where we can agree is that there are still are um, a lot of people who probably are taking statins who really don't need to take statins. Mm, and I suppose that's where being able to have access to these more subtle kind of tests is really right. important, checking coronary, coronary artery scores and things like that. That's helps right. The clinical decision. Yeah, the more information that we can gather, that I can gather as a, as a clinician, including uh, not just the blood test, but as you mentioned, the I, I, I do often use a coronary calcium score to help uh, decide if there's a uncertainty about um, whether a patient's a candidate for statin. All, all of that comes into uh, the clinical judgment in mm. arena. Mm. And 
I guess it's also important that people attend to lifestyle factors at the same time because the statin is sort of, you can't just take the statin and go, I can do whatever I like, I'm now right. safe. Right, yeah, it's not, it's not a license uh, to kill. <laughs> you know, when, when, when uh, you know, uh, all of the healthful lifestyle practices, because statins, you know, have, have, uh, have, have benefits if, if, if they are needed uh, through their effects on cholesterol. And also they have an anti-inflammatory effect, as I mentioned, that's another component that we uh, know is involved with heart disease. So those are two effects of statin that we know are beneficial. But there's lots of other aspects of heart disease risk that are not necessarily impacted by statins. Uh, statins doesn't uh, replace uh, uh, being lean or, or you know, avoiding obesity, uh, exercising, uh, et cetera. Uh, and, it, and it also doesn't, uh, uh, it doesn't uh, give you the um, kind of uh, uh, okay to start indulging in, uh, in, in the kinds of unhealthful foods that we mentioned, foods that are high in simple sugars and in carbs, for example, um, you, you, it really, because many people are at risk for heart disease because not just of a single factor like high cholesterol, it, it's a combination of factors. Mm -hmm. And we try to operate on all cylinders when we've got patients, that people that are uh, concerned about their heart disease risk, we, uh, we need to work on all, all aspects of it. And I suppose a nutrient dense diet, I guess we don't have any evidence about that, but I suppose it would make sense that a nutrient dense diet would be fairly important um, to, reduce, yeah. to reduce risk as well. Yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there's lots of uh, unknowns, uh, you know, yeah. in, the, in the micronutrients and different food combinations. We, we don't really know all of the uh, um, factors, but um, yeah, it, it does make sense uh, to, to try to focus on um, just good, good overall nutrition. I did want to ask you about the reduce, the reduction in risk, because you said 30 to 40 percent, but I have seen arguments that that's relative risk, not actual risk reduction, and so that yeah. those, that looks quite different. Yeah, that, that, that is relative risk, and, that, and, uh, and, and that's really, uh, you know, all we have uh, to work with in terms of um, sort of gauging uh, the relative efficacy um, in comparison uh, with, in, with, with no treatment. I mean, cause that's really uh, a, a comparison with, uh, with, a, with a placebo. That's the, that's the, that's the difference in risk. Uh, the absolute risk um, is of course much, much smaller than that. Uh, uh, and the effect is therefore, uh, you know, kind of, uh, on a, on a much smaller scale. So, if, uh, uh, but it's very important to consider absolute risk. And it, it really gets at the issue of um, who should be taking statins. People that are taking statins um, should be at high absolute risk. That is their risk of having heart disease based on our best predictive formulas, which are not perfect by any means, um, would be something like having a 10% uh, or, or more likelihood of having a heart attack in the next um, 10 years. Uh, some people think it should be even a lower threshold than that. 5% would put somebody at high absolute risk. Uh, so that's what we're talking about. We're not talking about 90% likelihood of, of risk. We're talking about 5 to 10%. So then if you achieve a 30% or 40%, in some cases it can be 50%, but let's say it's a 40% reduction in risk if you're starting off uh, at, uh, with a 10% absolute risk, that's going to take you down from 10% to 6%. Uh, right. Yeah. So that, that, that looks small. <laughs> but um, that's just because the absolute risk is already starting off. So, so it's a little bit deceptive. I mean, I think um, you can, people that are unhappy about statins will say, well, you know, you've only reduced the absolute risk by 4%. Um, but that's just because we're starting off at a level that is not higher. <laughs> You're starting off at 50% and you, if your risk happened to be, let's say, 50% absolute risk, which is off the charts, then you'd be achieving a 25% reduction, or, or a, a, uh, what would it be, 50%, 40%, uh, then you'd be having a 20% reduction in risk of absolute risk. So it's, 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 it's kind of an arithmetic game. Um, um, but the, the point is that uh, you have to consider what are the odds with and without statins, and your odds are reduced um, in, in the right patient. Um, with the right starting risk uh, by, by, by 30, 40% or more.
And that's the key point, isn't it? And the yeah. right nutrition. And that's right. probably where we need a little bit more better guidelines or a little bit more right. perhaps increased understanding with GPs maybe who tend to just prescribe a statin as soon as they see some elevated right. Yeah, yeah. There, there's probably um, kind of mis, you know, misallocation in both directions. That is yeah. people that don't need it and uh, not getting it who are, who are getting it and then people who should be getting it who are not getting it uh, i worry about those both those categories oh. you mentioned about it increasing the risk of type 2 diabetes what about yes. taking a statin when you've got two, type 2 diabetes because that seems to be a fairly standard prescription certainly right. in new zealand right yeah well that's uh uh really a, a, an issue is that once once you once you've got diabetes you know if you're already starting out with diabetes uh it's well established that your risk of heart disease is increased just because of uh, having type 2 diabetes and unless you can reverse type 2 diabetes um which is sometimes possible with diet um then um uh, there is considerable evidence that statins will uh will reduce your risk of heart disease so um, and and the, and the if there's an effect that tends to worsen the diabetes, it's only it's only a small effect, um, and it can be managed usually with whatever the patient is taking for the diabetes. It's possible to control the blood sugar even if the statins cause a slight increase in blood sugar on di uh, 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 in, in those patients. Um, what what we don't want to have happen is somebody that does not have diabetes. Um, and who may not necessarily need a statin, um, starting to take a statin and then developing diabetes. Uh, that's that's a, that's a no no. Um, but but I, it's sort of a little bit ironic in a way. But once you have, if you already have diabetes, statins are beneficial not not for the diabetes, but for the heart disease risk associated with diabetes. So you touched on earlier that you know the people who oppose statin use. I mean, some people just don't think that cholesterol is a problem and we should ever take well, a statin. That, that, that's, even, that's even worse. I mean, I, I, yeah. we, we can talk about that. That's, a, that's taking it to the extreme, which is yeah. terrible. But they will often point out that the research shows that yet there's a reduced risk in heart disease. And you mentioned this a little bit a few minutes ago, but maybe total mortality doesn't change. Right. Um, do you have any, you know, what would you yeah. say to them or do you have any thoughts about yeah. that? Yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's lots of ways of kind of doing the, you know, the math uh, to, to make uh, the, the, the issue murkier. Um, and, and one of them is, you know, how many minutes of life do you gain by taking statins and, and that sort of thing. Um, uh, and uh, it, it does come down to this issue of mortality. Uh, as I mentioned, it's very hard uh, to uh, to prove um, improve mortality, uh, uh, except in population, except in people that are already at very high risk. So, for the majority of the population, um, mortality over uh, a, a five or seven year period, when you're doing these tri these trials, can't go on for forty or fifty years. The, the drug trials, um, at most, are maybe seven years. Um, that is often not enough time to really test an effect on mortality. So you don't really have an answer. Um, uh, having said that, um, the evidence is weak, particularly for, uh, you know, for, for women, um, uh, showing benefit of for primary prevention, that is for trying to protect from the first heart attack. Uh, uh, the, the, there's really not good evidence for, uh, in fact, there's no evidence for improved mortality in that population. So if, if that's the case, then why uh you know why take a statin um well um that uh argument i think fails if you're thinking of protecting from uh, heart disease and stroke for people that again that are at high risk for whatever reason uh, based on their on their metabolic profile or family history or or whatever um uh women do show benefit on heart heart attacks and stroke even though we can't necessarily prove a benefit on mortality. So um, my argument is, um, you know, living longer is one thing. You know, maybe it's our genes that are more, most important for that. Maybe, maybe it's not so much the cholesterol level. Um, but um, having a stroke or a heart attack and being disabled with heart failure uh, or the consequences of a stroke 
to me, is a sufficient reason to be serious about trying to reduce that risk. Mm. Mm. So just to summarize, before I, I let you go and carry on with your afternoon, right. um, so to summarize what we're talking about, what we've talked about today is that we can reduce our risk through our diet and lifestyle. Or what a certain group of people can, you know, there are other people like myself who um, have genetic reasons for very elevated cholesterol, but most people can reduce their risk by getting that cluster of metabolic um, syndrome issues resolved. Would that be a fair comment? You know, get your blood pressure down. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I could... like glycerides, yep. It's doable. It, it, it takes, you know, commitment and an understanding uh, and, and, a, and a sort of a, a longer term view um, of, uh, of what you're uh, going to achieve. It can't just be a short term, uh, you know, change. It's got to be lifelong. Yeah, yeah. And then we concentrate on eating foods or living a lifestyle that hopefully increases our, our large um, yeah, particles rather than these small, these small dense ones that will get into right. the artery wall. Right. Yep. And then for a certain group of people, after proper consultation with a really good clinician who can really identify their personal risks, like this, I guess this is where you come back to personalized medicine, or then right. taking a statin or some other lowering cholesterol lowering drug may be really important and relevant to them. Would that be a yeah. fair summary that's, of that's, <laughs> that's that that uh, boils it down to the uh, key points, yes. Yeah, yeah. Just so that people have got something, you know, sort of constructive they can take away. And think about and consider. Sure, mm. sure, yeah, yeah, that, yeah. And, and 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 I would take advantage uh, uh, of of specialists um, uh, when when there's uncertainty about uh, about what to do. Um, I, I, I'm sure there's good lipidologists uh, in New Zealand now with the uh, with telemedicine. Uh, you can go go around. I see. I, you know, I take care of patients from all over the world through uh, the. Uh, Zoom mechanism. So, uh, so oh, people yeah. should people should people should take advantage of expertise to help me help guide uh, yeah. their decisions if they're if they're uncertain about what to do. So, would you see patients from New Zealand through Zoom? Are you able to do that? Uh, I think so. <laughs> I've not had a New Zealand patients, but uh, <laughs> I've had them from other part, from because know, from I can. Um, you know, if, would you like to let people know where they can find you actually? And I'll make sure that goes in the show notes just in case anybody is, you know, I mean, I think, you know, like for myself, I'm probably quite a reasonably complex case. I've got APOE44 gene, you know. Oh, so, really? Oh, oh yeah, my. Yeah, yeah. Okay, that's a whole other, that's a whole other discussion. <laughs> you know, it's, it's, uh, not, it's not standard sort of um, yeah, yeah. standard risk profile. Um, mm. Well, I can give you... Um, uh, we have an email uh, contact from my from my clinic that um, I can I can give you. Um, uh, and that's a, it's a, just look it up. It's, 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 you want to take it down? CCMH. 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 Um, um, at. Uh, it's called jump. The, the the program is called Jumpstart and the J U M P S T A R T dot com. Dot com. Great. I can if I can't find it, I'll I can just yeah. Let, let me know because I, I don't I don't usually I I I, I don't usually uh, I usually prefer uh, people. Um, uh, you know, by by email when, when they contact me, I, I, and I think that's the correct uh, one. If, if it doesn't work, let me know. But I just thought there might be. You know, I know I've got a few clients who have some rather unusual lipid profiles, and there may be people who you know may like to consult with you over Zoom if that was a possibility. So yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, the, you know, the, 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 the 
the <laughs> pandemic has kind of broadened our scope, isn't it? Yeah, yeah which is really good. Yeah. Well, Dr. Prell, thank you so much for your time today. Um, well, great talking with you. A really um, complex subject. I know we just sort of very briefly touched on a few points, but that may yeah. generate interest in people to look deeper, maybe follow some more of your work. I have actually got some of your videos up on my oh, uh, website okay. so that people okay. have been able to have a look at those. Anyway, you've done a couple of really good presentations. Well, thank you. And uh, I've enjoyed this one as well. And I hope, it, hope it's uh, helpful. Thank you very much okay. for your time. All the best. Bye-bye, Susan. Thank you.